Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to uh, help uh, in this uh, celebration of uh, this wonderful scientist, Jim Barber, uh, on this uh, sunny day in July. Uh, I wish that I were with you in uh, Singapore, uh, but unfortunately, uh, many commitments are, for the moment, keeping me here. Uh, and today, I'd like to talk about uh, research related to uh, Jim's research, in that it uh, deals, in a way, with photosynthesis, or part of it. Uh, the, uh, uh, here is a slide uh, that uh, tells something about the uh, uh, photosynthetic uh, reaction center in, uh, in bacteria, and uh, a, uh, a Nobel Prize was won for the structure of this species around 1988, I think. And uh, uh, part of this whole bilayer system uh, that's involved in the uh, uh, picking up of solar energy here, transferring the excitation to here, transferring charge across there, eventually leading to this ATPase. And uh, it's this ATPase that I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, here is a slide that uh, I uh, saw that Jim had, and I asked him, and he kindly uh, gave it to me. Uh, and this describes here the uh, a central portion of Jim's uh, work on uh, the conversion of uh, water to form oxygen. Um, and uh, in this photosystem two, uh, and here is the structure, uh, especially this part, here is the structure that Jim has uh, been so influential in learning about. Uh, again, th there are various uh, other biological systems that span this uh, membrane. And here is this ATP synthase again. So it's common to both uh, systems. Uh, this involves plants. The other involves bacteria. Both involve the utilization of solar energy uh, initially. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on today are sing single molecule studies that have been made of, uh, of this uh, ATPase. Uh, uh, and here it is uh, blown up. Uh, the, uh, uh, what happens uh, in the ATP is, is that protons come in from one side, generated by those other reactions that I showed, and they go around a split channel, come out the other side. In the process of doing so, they cause this stock to turn. This stock is is uh, asymmetrically related to these subunits, which causes them to open and close. And uh, that opening and closing causes this reaction uh, to form, namely the adenosine uh, diphosphate and inorganic phosphate to form ATP, which is a big energy source in all sorts of biological systems and is used for many things. So I'm going to talk about single molecule studies uh, of this system, or more particularly, of a part of the system. Because what people have done is they've taken the central stalk and they split it, they've cut it there, they turned it upside down, uh, and uh, they've made various studies, single molecule studies, with them. And I'll describe a few of them. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, one of them is the uh, a uh, freely uh, rotating uh, experiment where ATP is going in and it's uh, rotating and uh, causing the system to rotate, and that's observed in various ways that I'll describe. Another is where you use uh, uh, a controlled rotation of the uh, uh, of the uh, that rotor uh, that uh, you control it actually by uh, uh, electromagnetic fields. Uh, and another way is uh, uh, where you stall this uh, rotation at various angles and look at you going back and forth. And there are various other methods. The main thing is that these are single molecule studies on this uh, particular enzyme. And these studies, in, co in combination with the many studies that have been done in bulk systems, tell you a lot more about the mechanism of what's going on. Because the key question you want to learn about is, how does this mechanical motion combine with the chemistry in order to produce more chemistry? So that's the central problem. That's the central experimental problem of these single molecule studies. That's the central theoretical problem of these studies. <clears throat> uh, so here is uh, uh, one of these experiments uh, that is showing up here. That's a, a, a gold bead that's going to have light reflecting on it, and uh, the light ref uh, reflecting from that 
uh, shows the rotation uh, of this motor. There are six stable positions of the motor, uh, various pauses that in between those six stable positions. And what one is seeing is this light coming off, and that's telling one about how the motor is moving, how the rotary part of the motor is uh, moving in steps. And here is, uh, here is the plot of these steps uh, that were revealed by the uh, of various angles, uh, known angles, and uh, one analyzes data of that type uh, to uh, learn about the rates of the individual processes that occur in this system. Uh, here's a, a, an important experiment. It's this freely rotating system of the type that I described, uh, just described. And uh, here one is comparing the rate of rotation of the system. And, uh, uh, and we know how many uh, molecules, ATP molecules, are consumed per rotation. It happens to be three. Uh, compared with the uh, rate of the hydrolysis reaction that's been measured experimentally. If these two types of data didn't agree, you see they agree pretty well. These are different sort of aspects of them. Uh, but they agree, different kinds agree very well. If they didn't agree, all bets would be off. There'd be no point in studying the study of the single molecule would just simply not refer to the actual system. But the fact that they agree is the encouraging thing that uh, uh, makes one uh, go on to recognizing that one is studying systems at the single molecule level instead of at the many molecule level. Instead of six to the 23rd molecules, you're studying one molecule, and that the study is relevant. That's, uh, that was an important thing to establish early on. And this paper, in fact, is from uh, early on. Uh, now, uh, here's an example of a controlled uh, rotation experiment where you have a pair of electromagnets. And uh, it's uh, causing uh, this uh, bead here, this magnetic bead, to rotate. Uh, so it's, uh, and that magnetic bead is attached to that gamma shaft, causing that shaft in the ATPase to rotate. And um, when it rotates, then various things happen. ATP goes in, and uh, if you use a special form of ATP that can fluoresce, a special a modified form, then when it's inside, that modified form is bound, and it fluoresces. When it's outside, it doesn't fluoresce. So by looking at the fluorescence as a function of time, these, uh, uh, here's a lot of fluorescence, here's little fluorescence. We'll learn something about the, uh, the properties of this rotation. Uh, and so there are two, uh, two observables here. One is the uh, occupancy, uh, which you tell by the fluorescence, and the uh, rotor angle at that occupancy. And uh, as I mentioned, it's only when the ATP is bound that this modified ATP can fluoresce. Many systems uh, actually are, are of that nature, that if you bind them, uh, they will fluoresce, and if you don't bind them, they won't fluoresce. So this is an example of that. Well, here are some results that have been attained uh, with the controlled rotation experiments, and where we used in the theory, and I'll describe the theory in a moment, where we used the theory to make predictions from one set of experiments, so-called Stalling experiments, to what those controlled rotation experiments yielded. And uh, here's the comparison of theory and experiment. And the important thing here in the comparison is that there are no adjustable parameters. Uh, one can always fit uh, 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 theory to experimental data by just uh, having a formula with a lot of adjustable parameters. But here, there are no adjustable parameters, so it's a severe, severe test. And uh, here you have the experimental points uh, that are shown by these dots here. And, uh, these lines that are drawn are the theoretical lines calculated from other data, uh, so independent data. And as you see, they agree very well. So that's an, uh, that's an indication that the theory that we formulated for this, you might call a chemical mechanical system, is working well, at least for this uh, property here. Uh, in more recent work, this is work that's uh, appeared in uh, 2017. We've looked at the whole range, and there are various interesting details of the, uh, the rate constant in one direction and the rate constant blue in the opposite direction, and uh, the various tra trends that occur that I won't try to go, uh, go to, through here. But the main thing is that these details, when you look at them in details, tell you more about the mechanism and how the chemistry is combined with the mechanics in order to make this uh, thing work. 
Uh, all right, what about the theory? The theory actually uh, rests upon uh, a model that's been sometimes used in purely chemical systems. Remember, essentially all chemical reactions are purely chemical. They're not combined with mechanics. In these molecular motors, they are combined. They're relatively few. They're extensive in biology, but they're relatively few in chemistry as a whole. Now, in this uh, description that we're using, we have something called that chemists call the reaction coordinate. That if you have a reaction, you go along that coordinate and you convert reactants to products, and there's a whole elaborate machinery that's connected with determining the, what is a good reaction coordinate. And uh, a model of the uh, process, the chemical process, is uh, that you have fluctuations of what's called the free energy about the, uh, the most stable sort of uh, position of the uh, reactants, or really a set of arrangements, and similarly a different arrangements for the products. And the reaction consists of fluctuations of the free energy to reach that point there and then go down. In actual practice, this thing is rounded off, but those are details that we needn't go into here, but they don't really affect the, uh, the thrust of what we're, gonna, what we're talking about. Uh, here's the key equation uh, that we use for the, how fast the reaction goes, the so-called rate constant, how it depends on the driving force, how downhill the reaction is, and another property of the reaction. And the idea is to use this equation somehow to combine the chemistry with the mechanics in order to uh, 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 obtain a theoretical result that you can compare with experiment. And uh, I'm sorry for all the details on here, but the main thing is that, that the rate constant depends exponentially on some free energy barrier. There was a free energy barrier you saw on the previous slide to get to that intersection. And, that, and here, what's special about it in the mechanics part is this free energy barrier depends on the angle of rotation. Um, and uh, that's how the mechanics comes into the reaction rate. And uh, here's this uh, uh, barrier in terms of this quadratic formula that I showed. Here's this quadratic formula, this delta G0 tells one how downhill the reaction is or uphill as a function of the angle, the rotor angle theta. And here we've expressed it in terms of uh, what it is in terms of fluctuations from the initial equilibrium position of the rotor to the final equilibrium position. And from this, there's enough equations to, uh, to make the uh, predictions. Uh, and uh, the uh, example of the prediction was one that I showed on a previous slide that showed with no adjustable parameters how things compare. There are many other things to look at. And in fact, in um, uh, just this year, uh, Shander bogan Casco and I uh, have uh, recently published a paper in uh, PNAS on, these, on what's called long time binding events, where the ATP goes in and much later comes out as ADP. That's covering that whole gamut of angles that I showed. And uh, what we're in the process of doing, it is combining with some data that were never published because there was no theory, combine it with data that from, uh, obtained from the experimentalists involved and uh, see how well the theory applies to that whole gamut of angles. All right, so from this then, uh, what have we learned that uh, uh, some of which I commented on, some of which I haven't? First of all, the ATP binding rate is the same no matter whether the other sites, the other two sites for binding are occupied or not occupied. Uh, that tells one something. Secondly is how, that the various events are connected. For example, when ATP enters one site, there are three sites going, it catalyzes the ADP coming out at another end. It's almost as though when ATP is coming in, something is closing and something else is opening up so something can come out. So there's, there's a lot of connectedness in this uh, motor. And then um, uh, uh, the, uh, this is what we're learning about. Uh, we make use of the ensemble studies and part of the whole, whole affair, not just the single molecule studies. Uh, and this key question that when you take that F1 ATPase and you put it on a slide, so it's a truncated F, uh, a, F1, uh, ATP synthase, that uh, for the ATP binding rate, it's unaffected. So the results there are irrelevant. Now, uh, of course, with these techniques, there remains much to be done, not only with the techniques themselves, 
but also what was not learned. For example, these experiments didn't go into the detail of the uh, opening, the individual opening. They showed whether it's open or closed as determined by various things, but not into the individual opening. There are various methods, uh, namely what's called AFM and FRET, and uh, that are being used, and they may, they may provide some information, but that's an example of what was not learned. The whole study will not, uh, according to our plan, stop here, because there's a whole range of linear motors in biology, and we're uh, now looking to see to what extent these concepts on the combination of chemistry and mechanical motion will apply uh, to those systems also. Well, in summary, uh, Jim, Congratulations on this uh, marvelous uh, symposium. I very much wish that I could be here. Of course, Singapore is always a lovely place to be. But uh, in any case, uh, congratulations and on your remarkable accomplishments on this uh, uh, structure of this uh, water splitting reaction. Thank you. Bye.